Hi, if you're interested in oriental rugs and other textiles and the cultures that made them past and present, RugTube is the place for you. We welcome collectors, dealers, aficionados, and maybe even scholars to talk about what's new, what's old, ideas, theories, and maybe even a bit of speculation here and there. We at RugTube know real art is the kind you can walk on. This evening I'd like to say a few things about the Uyghur people along with East Turkestan rugs. I visited this region in 1996 and have some experience traveling there. It is a very remote part of the world. It is very low. It is very dry. But if farmed properly, the area can be made to bloom. It served as an important way station between East and West, starting with the Roman trade with China, the so-called Silk Road, where Chinese luxury goods, silk, porcelain, lacquers, traveled overland to the Roman Empire, and they would be purchased by the Romans using gold. This area has a very distinctive minority. The Uyghur people are Turks. They are not Han Chinese. So a lot of the press they receive today in terms of Chinese discrimination against the Uyghur people, against Muslims, it has a long-standing basis, and it is an ethnic difference. It's not simply one of culture. Briefly, the Uyghurs live primarily in the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region of the People's Republic of China, or the PRC as I'll refer to it here. This area is in southwest China, the Tarim Basin. The Uyghurs are recognized as ethnic minorities in the PRC. The Uyghurs are the people whom the old Russian travelers called Sarts. This is a name which they used for sedentary Turkic-speaking people. Western travelers called them Turkey in recognition of their language. The modern Uyghur language is part of the southeastern Turkic family. It is slightly less closely related to Uzbek, although Uzbek is part of the same family. It is very different from the Western Turkic languages, and in fact, knowing a bit of Turkmen helped me almost not at all in Xinjiang. Modern Uyghurs have adopted a number of scripts for their language. The Arabic script, known as the Chagatai alphabet, was adapted along with Islam. Political changes in the 20th century led to numerous reforms of script. DNA analyses indicate that the people of Central Asia, such as the Uyghurs, are all mixed Caucasian and East Asian. Uyghur act activists identify with the Tarim mummies, remains of ancient people who inhabited the region. The mummies indicate the migration of an Indo-European people into the Tarim area at the beginning of the Bronze Age, which is around 1800 BC. These people probably sc spoke a Tokarian language and were suggested by some to be the Yue Chi as mentioned in Chinese annals. The Yue Chi were driven away by the Song Nu, who some think are the Proto-Turks. This occurred particularly after a major defeat in 176 BC, where two branches of the Yue Chi spread west. One branch ended up in the Kushan Empire of northern India and Afghanistan, and would eventually become the Bactrian civilization that interacted with Greeks in the wake of Alexander the Great. Islamization of the people of the Tarim Basin was a gradual process starting in about the 10th century. By the 11th century, it was noted by Mahmud al-Kashgari that the Uyghurs spoke a pure Turkic language but they also still spoke another language among themselves, and they used two different scripts. As is clear from the history, this region was more or less aligned with the Han Chinese empires. This, in part, was because of geography. They were located in the middle of a desert, and it was difficult for the Han Chinese 
to get out to this region mil militarily. They would also naturally have an affinity with many of the peoples in Central Asia, although of course it wouldn't be an easy trek for them either. By the 1750s, the Qing dynasty, the Han Chinese, crushed the Buddhist dynasty that was in control of much of the region, and this led to the empowerment of many small Muslim kingdoms in southern Xinjiang. The Qing dynasty established new cities like Urumqi and Yuning, and Urumqi serves as something of a hub of the region even today. It is still very Han Chinese. There are relatively fewer, fewer Uyghur people here, whereas in Turfan, uh, Kashgar, Yarkand, there are many Uyghur people. During the Dungan Revolt of 1862-77, to 77, Uzbeks formed the Khanate of Kokand under Bazurg Khan and Yakub Beg, and they expelled Chinese officials from parts of southern Xinjiang and founded an independent Kashgarian kingdom. Under the leadership of Yakub Beg, it included Kashgar, Yarkand, Khotan, Aksu, Kucha, Korla, and Turpan. It was at this time when many of the collectible rugs from East Turkestan were made. In 1912, the Qing Dynasty was replaced by the PRC, the Republic of China. Uyghurs staged several uprisings, or uprisings against the Chinese rule. Twice, in 1933 and 1944, Uyghurs successfully gained their independence, briefly backed by Joseph Stalin. Uyghur identity remains fragmented as some support a pan-Islamic vision, while others support an ethnic-based pan-Turkic vision. The majority of modern Uyghurs are Sunnis, and there is a clear division between those that adhere to Sufi beliefs and those that do not. Rugs from this region are conventionally called Samarkand rugs in the West. This name is taken from the Uzbek city located on the Silk Road that was once a major center for the gathering rugs that would be exported. These rugs would actually have been produced in the towns of Hotan, Kashgar, or Yarkand. Rugs from Western China, also known as Eastern Turkestan, are quite different from rugs produced further east. East Turkestan rugs have a palette based primarily on red, blue, and yellow. Many designs reflect regional tastes as well as what some people think are Buddhist or shamanistic traditions. The layers used most often are superimposed medallions with three medallions, full field gulls or multiple niches, carpets, and finally the pomegranate tree variety of rug. This rug behind me shows clear pomegranate designs here. This is a very common design, as are the colors of the rug behind me, which again dates from likely the late 19th century to the early 20th century. The knotting system is asymmetrical Persian with a medium low density of knots. Cotton is usually used for the foundation, while both wool and silk are used for pile. The pile is usually trimmed to a medium low height. The shapes of the rugs are elongated. As a rule, the length is twice the width as this rug here. Some of the later 20th century rugs from this region are more squarish. The most traditional, although not the most common, is the pomegranate tree type, which is perhaps focused on a local fertility design. It's likely the pomegranate had long associations with harvest, perhaps also with sweetness, because the pomegranate can be harvested and made into a variety of wonderful desserts that are still made in this region. The field of these rugs is blue or light blue and covered by one or two intense red trees that grow from a small vase. The most common compositional layout is of three medallions. This arrangement is closely connected to local geometric taste and is probably influenced by Buddhist symbolism. 
Some people even suggest a Buddhist mandala. These examples, usually with red ground, are characterized by a row of three large octagonal medallions, usually colored blue. It also is somewhat reminiscent of Mamluk rugs, but of course, nobody wants to draw an equal sign because they're separated by such a distance in both time and space. It is important to realize that these rugs do not represent the earliest designs used by Turks when they entered Anatolia. Good examples are found in the Konya fragments attributed to the Seljuks of the 13th and 14th century, now in the Museum of Turkish and Islamic Art in Istanbul. They're very distinctive from these rugs. East Turkestan designs reflect traditions going back several hundred years, at least. Buddhism is now totally eradicated from this region. The use of colors and designs are unique. According to historical sources, there have been migrations of people into the re region, large migrations, since the 19th century. Commercial products conform to old local types rather than a profusion of different ethnic styles. This is an interesting observation and suggests that there is a period of acculturation that has been going on. It's interesting to see what earlier rug authors had to say about rugs from this region. I'll start with Wolf, How to Identify Oriental Rugs. This book dates to 1931. <clears throat> History and, re and religion are woven into the fabric of all oriental rugs if one could but read the s signs aright. Symbols survive long after the original significance has been forgotten. Passing influence leaves a permanent trace. Conquests and victories cross and recross the looms. Clearer, plainer than any other eastern weave, the history of Samarkand is written in its rugs. This is a very interesting introduction. However, nobody can be sure today what design originally came from a Buddhist or animist tradition and what design is quite at home in the local Islamic tradition that we have to remember first arrived in about the 10th century. Dilly has more to say, writing from 1931. He has a bit more to say, particularly about the design inspirations of these rugs. Kashgar and Yarkand rugs, like the rugs of the neighbor cities of Jordis and Kula and Asia Minor, are attributed more or less arbitrarily. Rugs showing most Persian character are assigned to Kashgar because Yarkand, comparatively, is an aloof city on the caravan way to India. Rugs of both cities used for color Chinese red, blue, and yellow in strong contrast. Probably five out of ten examples are dominantly red, two blue, one yellow, and one ivory. The most popular design consists of three blue medallions ornamented with stiff flowers woven tandem on a plain red field. Corner areas are commonly latch hook. Borders consist of wave, mountain, and cloud motifs separated by T, key, and swastika stripes. Occasionally, a prayer rug of Mohammedan design is secured in these cities, but correctly or otherwise, the reputation for prayer rugs is monopolized by Lhasa. This is an interesting observation and uh, perhaps not quite correct. There are many safs, in other words, multiple niche prayer rugs that come from East Turkestan. There are a few more modern, meaning perhaps early 20th century single niche prayer rugs that also come from this area. Finally, I can discuss Tadashal from 1922. He states about these rugs, though preponderantly Chinese in design and color, 
They have a character of their own which renders them distinguishable as a rule from the carpets of northern China. The pattern of sea waves in the border is very common in these carpets. The fret ornament in the corners and the rosettes in the middle are motifs are frequently found. Sometimes these carpets are more definitely based on those of Western Asia, although the color scheme and the details of the pattern are still Chinese. I would suggest that there is perhaps less connection between this region and Western Asia as this author would suggest. I would say perhaps that because of the Silk Route that was functioning until the recent change of trade routes, this Silk Route would have allowed rugs to pass relatively freely east to west. It's therefore perhaps wrong to credit one particular region with being a pioneer of a design when in fact it would be difficult to say who came first. As with many other oriental rugs, there is so much left to learn, particularly when these rugs are compared and contrasted with other arts. Luckily, at least for now, this region is relatively stable and it is possible to visit there and experience not only the rugs and textiles, but the entire culture. Thank you very much.